It is truly good to see everyone this morning. It is good to see Dalton's smiling face. Haven't seen him in a while. And it is certainly good to see Dallas and Emily with us as they will be closing on their new house before long. If you have your Bibles and you're not already, already there, turn with me to Luke chapter 12 because we're going to be going over the parable of the wise and the faithful servants. It's found in Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 48. Now, earlier in this very same chapter, Jesus also taught another parable. It was a parable of the rich farmer or the rich fool. And that parable warns against placing too much emphasis on the material, earthly things of this life. And that parable was introduced by these words in verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. According to God, a person who is not rich toward God, but has his heart set on earthly things, the material, temporal things, is nothing but a fool. A little bit later in this same chapter, verses 22 through 34, Jesus elaborates on the dangers of earthly cares. He assures us that God cares for the birds and for the grasses of the field. He will also provide for those who place their faith in him. <clears throat> and he stresses in verse 31 that his followers should rather seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. He further taught in verse 34 that where people find their treasures determines where their heart is going to be. In our parables this morning, Jesus contrasts the attitude of that rich farmer, that rich fool, with the attitude that the faithful and wise servants of Christ should have. And as with all parables, there is a central or primary lesson that we need to keep in mind. And that primary lesson is that the fool has his heart and his mind set on earthly things, whereas the faithful and the wise servants of Christ, they have their minds and their hearts set on spiritual things. Now, as we begin our parable in verses 35 through 38, Jesus emphasizes the need to be watchful, and ready to serve. He begins the parable with the admonition in verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. The terminology uses here that Jesus uses here refers to the garments that were commonly worn back there in the first century. He refers to that loose outer robe, which was more for appearance than practical use. This robe would often hinder free movement and therefore is either removed or it was bound up with a belt or a girdle when someone was going to put forth some activity. And the activities that would require the loins being girded up would be things like working and serving, running, doing battle, any activity that required a lot of movement. Now to have one's loins already girded that emphasizes and suggests a readiness to serve. The faithful and wise servants of the Lord should always be ready to do the Lord's bidding at any time, even at the drop of a hat. This prepared readiness comes from a separation of the love of the world and its goods and from knowing what the Lord's will is. Detachment from this world is closely associated with preparedness for the next life. Albert Barnes made this consideration concerning this passage. He says, be ready at all times to leave the world and enter into rest when your Lord shall call you. Let every obstacle be taken out of the way. Let every earthly care be removed and be prepared to follow him into his rest. So we, as we know not the hour when God shall call us, should always be ready to die. In other words, we are not to be like that rich farmer in the, pre, the early part of this chapter and not be ready to meet our maker. Now, our readiness and alertness is emphasized time and again throughout the New Testament. In the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins found in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells us in verse 10 that they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. 
In the passage before us in our parable this morning in verse 40, he says, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. In terms of mental preparedness, I want you to listen to the words of Peter in 1 Peter 1.13. He says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means at his appearance when he comes again. So the girding up of these loins suggests mental alertness and spiritual preparedness. Now that phrase here, having your lights burning, suggests a return of the Lord during the night as noted to the references in the second and third watches of the night, verse 38. Now the significance of these lights burning is the idea of watchfulness. In waiting for the Lord to come, the servant must clearly see the dangers that are about him and be alert before the Lord arrives. The idea of watchful, watchfulness is another thing that is emphasized all throughout the New Testament. In fact, in Mark chapter 13, verses 34 through 37, Jesus said this concerning his second coming. He says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Paul also gave an admonition in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, Watch ye, stand fast, quit you like men, be strong. Also in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6 through 8, he gives a warning. <clears throat> Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and foreign helmet, the hope of salvation. And these are just a few of the references to Christ's second coming and the watchfulness and the preparedness that we should have concerning that time and that day. You know, a message that is so often repeated throughout the, the Bible is recognized as something that is vitally important. Watch. Keep your lights burning because the Lord is going to come. Now, according to Jesus, faithful disciples are like men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding, verse 36. Here is a reference to the wedding banquet, which is very typical of that day. And the custom was that this was going, he was going to come at an unannounced time, a time in which no one could really foretell and the bridegroom would come and claim his bride at her parents' house. And then he would take her to his own house. Whatever time that happened to be, and oftentimes it was very late in the night, the servants were, <coughs> were expected to be ready for their return. The parallel between the spiritual servants of the Lord and the servants of the bridegroom I think is quite obvious here. Our Lord has gone into heaven, and he has gone there to prepare a place for us. And one day he will come unexpectedly at any time to claim his bride, which is the church. And his faithful servants, they patiently wait for his return. And the time for the preparation for his return is now before he does make his return. The statement in verse 36, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately, is a reference that when the groom does come and knocks, there's not going to be further time to prepare. So you have to be ready now, not later. Looking forward to the time of Jesus' return is a characteristic of his faithful servants. 
Paul, in referring to the loyalty and the devotion of Christians, said this in Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And also in Hebrews 10, 28, it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, without sin, unto salvation. Now, according to our parable, in verse 37, when the bridegroom arrives, it says, He shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. The idea here is when the Lord returns, the faithful and the wise servants will be given extraordinary blessings. The joys and the privileges and the blessings of heaven are certainly comprehended here in this statement. Salvation will be given to the faithful and the wise servants of Jesus Christ when he comes in judgment in the last day. Now the possibility of the groom returning home in the second or third watch is mentioned right here in verse 38. And you think about the day back then. <clears throat> the day was divided into four different watches by the Romans. The second and the third watches were the night hours. This may suggest that the Lord's return may be a little bit longer than what some may think. And that delay is a test of our faithfulness. Now the second coming of Christ is likened unto a thief who would break into a house. We see this in verses 39 and 40. The fact is that Jesus' coming is not going to be preceded by any signs or by any warnings. A thief does not go and announce to a, a person who owns a house if and when he's going to break into their house. And in this, this very sense, Jesus Christ will also come as a thief. Jesus here, again, advises constant sleepless vigilance for the coming of the Lord. I want you to notice the similarity between the imagery used here in our parable and that used of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. He says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction, construct, uh, destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Now the suddenness of Christ's coming ought to influence the way that we live day by day, knowing that it's going to be unannounced and that he will come suddenly, we need to always be prepared for that very day. I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, but the day of the Lord would come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? We are to be living right at all times, waiting for that day. Listen also to what Jesus told the church at Sardis in Revelation 3, verse 3. He says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Just like the householder has to be ready at all times to make sure that his house is always protected. So also, we need to be ready at all times, not knowing what hour our Lord may come. And we need to be prepared for that day because when least expected, Jesus will come. We see this here in verse 40. He says, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now, it was at this point here that Peter interrupts with a question here in verse 41. He said, Lord, that speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? What Jesus has said here so far has really aroused Peter's 
uh, interest and his curiosity. Jesus has been speaking about those who would not be ready at his coming, but also, I'm sorry, he's talking about those who would be ready, but he's implying that some would also not be ready. From verse 22 on, the master has been directing his attention to his disciples and not to the vast multitude. So did the master mean that even among his disciples there would be those who would not welcome him at that time or be ready to do so? To whom was Jesus actually telling this parable about? Well, Jesus' answer is indirect, and it's in the form of a parable, verses 42 through 44. In essence, Jesus is telling him that it is the faithful and the wise servants who will be ready to welcome Jesus when he does come. His answer comes in a question. Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Remember this. Christians are stewards while in the service to Christ. And we have to understand, as stewards, nothing belongs to us. It all belongs to the master. And we are to use these things that have been left to our possession to be used in the interest of the master. And faithfulness is a characteristic that all stewards are to possess, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, of which will bring great and rich rewards to us. Jesus said this in our text in verses 43 and 44. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. The Lord will richly bless the steward, whom he will find faithfully discharging his duties when he comes back again. And this is a sure and precious promise. This is something that we can bank on. Now, the loyal servant will faithfully discharge all of his responsibilities, whether his Lord's return is early or late. But in contrast, in verses 45 through 48, the unfaithful servant sees the delay of his Lord as an opportunity to be able to display his wickedness. Now, the process of evil for this faith, unfaithful servant, of course, begins in his heart, as we see in verse 45. This servant reasons with himself, and he's thinking, well, you know, it's been a long time since my master left, and I figure it'd be a long time before he ever comes back again. And therefore, I can do what I want to do the way I want to do it. I can be my own boss. His idea was very similar to those that expressed this same thing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, where it says, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So this servant here starts to revel. And he begins eating and drinking to drunkenness. He even figured that he had time to mistreat his fellow servants for a while and then have time to straighten things out before the Lord comes. But all of a sudden, without warning, the master comes back. Now, because of the Lord's discovery of the unfaithful discharge of this steward's duties, this steward is severely punished. It says he's cut asunder. That means that he's going to face the death penalty, and he's going to be cut up into pieces. And yet that's really nothing compared to the penalty that the unfaithful servants of Christ are going to have to endure because what they are going to have to endure is eternal punishment. Punishment that will never, ever end. Their portion is going to be among the unbelievers, verse 46. And their punishment is going to be as if they had never before believed. And their punishment is going to be so severe that it's going to be with weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 24, 51. There's going to be all kinds of wailing, weeping because of the pain. There's going to be gnashing of teeth. It's going to be this intense gritting of the teeth. Have you ever seen somebody in pain and how they grit their teeth? And this is the way it's going to be for the unfaithful servants. Now, the disobedient servant, whether he knew the Lord's will or not, 
he's still going to be punished. He's still going to be lost. The one who knows his master's will and intentionally disobeys, he's going to be beaten with many stripes. But the one who did not know the master's will and still disobeys, he's going to be beaten with few stripes. Both are going to be punished because both did wrong. And therefore, ignorance is not going to be an excuse on that day. The number of stripes seems to indicate degrees of punishment here. Some will suffer more than others depending upon their knowledge and the opportunities that they had in this life. The righteous, those who are pardoned by the blood of the Lamb, the good news is they're not going to receive one single stripe. The reason is because the Lord bore our stripes for us because we've been pardoned by his blood. One day there's going to be an accounting given by every person who has ever lived on this earth. And ignorance to God's word is not going to be an excuse. <clears throat> In fact, Jesus said this, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him much will be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. The servants of the Lord need to be constantly watchful and ready for the return of our Lord. Because when the Lord returns, he's going to do so in the twinkling of an eye, faster than you can just blink your eyes. And there's not going to be an opportunity for us to prepare then. There's not going to be any signs, there's not going to be any warnings before he comes, but he's going to come unexpected, just like a thief in the night. And though his return may be a little bit longer than what some may think that he should, it does not allow us to mistreat one another or to live for the pleasures of the flesh. All of the disobedient are going to be lost, whether we knew the Lord's will or whether we were ignorant of it. And that punishment is going to be extremely severe. It's going to be in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, described as the second death. So my admonition to you is trust in the Lord and his, in his words. Because he is coming, and one day we're going to have to give an account of what we did in this life. Don't be a fool. Live for Jesus today. Obey his will and be faithful unto death. Always be watching and ready for the coming of the Lord because we don't know when he's going to come. It could be today. It could be a thousand years from now. We don't know. It's not worth taking the chance. So in order to be ready, we encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess his sweet name before men and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And when you do that, the Lord is faithful. He will add you to his church, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the body of the saved. Now, if you are a child of God, you've already obeyed the gospel, then live faithful unto death so you can receive that crown of life that Jesus spoke of in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. There is a great day coming. And that day really depends on what it's going to be, how you live your life what you've done in preparation for that day. It might be a bright day. It might be a sad day. Are you ready for that day? If you're not, let us help you be prepared. If there's anything that we can help you with this morning, we encourage you to respond to the invitation while together we stand and sing.